I can. Great. So let's do this. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Ghost Egg 101. In this uh, uh, workshop, I want to talk about how we uh, solved the blockchain trilemma. And uh, I want to stress out that uh, solving the trilemma is a very uh, complicated thing. And it has many, many aspects which go beyond the consensus layer. But this talk is focused on the consensus layer. So um, my purpose here is to let you know about the many problems we had to solve to have a function in consensus layer that gives all the utilities we want. There are many other aspects to CASPA, which I'll briefly mention at the end, and each of them merits its own um, two hours or more uh, long workshop. So keep that in mind. So what is the blockchain trilemma? So essentially there is a trifecta of uh, three properties that we would want our um, a decentralized magical internet money to um, provide. And they are the uh, infamous security, scalability, and decentralization. And each of these terms has many interpretations, many different meanings. And in this talk, I'm gonna talk about um, their meaning, mostly in the context of proof of work consensus, as I said. There are some minor exceptions. We are going to go a bit beyond the consensus layer. And uh, just to be clear, when I'm talking about the consensus layer, essentially what I mean is that we don't look inside the blocks. We don't care about transactions. We don't care about uh, mempool. Um, all we care about is that we have this structure of how blocks interconnect and we want to reach some agreement about how to um, interpret them. So right now I'm being abstract and I'm gonna be more concrete very, very soon. So before I'm gonna proceed with the talk, I wanna say uh, what's not gonna be in this talk. So first of all, I'm not gonna talk about relaxed notions of security and scalability. You can go beyond the consensus layer and uh, achieve a relaxed notion of security and scalability over L2. You have some security concessions which are interesting in their own right. I'm not going into this. I'm not going to talk about strength and no, stronger notions of security either. You can talk about uh, MEV, selfish mining, all sorts of things that uh, are also uh, beyond what I consider the consensus layer. They are important, but they are not. Uh, we can't go into them right now. And I'm not going to talk about aspects of decentralization, which are also outside the scope of consensus, like coin distribution, like distribution of the mining, um, hardware entry barriers, all these uh, kind of things, which are, are indeed very important, but they are not the focus of the current talk. So I'm going to say what I mean by security and scalability and decentralization. So. What, when I say security, I mean Nakamoto consensus security. Uh, what this means is that a computationally inferior attacker can't mess with the transactions, and you can divide this kind of messing with them into two things. One is to revert transactions much after they occurred, what we call a double spend attack. And the other kind of tempering, which is often get, uh, gets overlooked, is that if there is some sort of conflict, then um, I can delay the resolution. I can't make a transaction which is considered confirmed go away, but I can post some kind of conflict and draw uh, its resolution forever and ne never let it settle. Um, now, people often say that um, Bitcoin or uh, Nakamoto consensus in general gives you security against any computational uh, inferior attacker. But that's not quite true. Uh, there is a subtlety here. Um, it's actually impossible to be secure against any computational inferior attacker. What you can do is to decide how close to half the attacker would have to be. You can say, I want to be secure against 48% attacker, 49% attacker, and then you can design your system to achieve this. So you can get as close as you want to have, but you have to determine in advance how close is close enough. You can't hope to be um, secure against all computational inferior attackers, even if they are very, very close to half. And the thing is that in all systems, 
when delta gets small, when you provide security closer and closer and closer to half, there is some cost to pay. Usually, uh, it's in terms of efficiency, either it means you'd have to wait a long time for confirmation times like in Bitcoin, or it means that um, it would just be very, very inefficient and uh, computationally intractable. Um, this, uh, by decentralization, first I mean that the system is permissionless. You can't have anyone maintain a list of who is allowed to participate. Everyone which follows the rules is allowed to participate. And the, thing, the second property is that your ability to affect the system, what we call voting power, and it's a very powerful abstractization in general to think about a block as like voting on what you think is the true state. And we want uh, uh, participants' voting power to be proportional to its computational power. If you have 10% of the global hash rate of the network, you have 10% of the blocks. You affect 10% of the decisions in uh, some uh, uh, sense. And another thing, uh, which is a subtlety, is that we want a small variance in this voting power. If you get 10% of the vote, but uh, one day you get 30%, and then the next two days you get nothing, that's bad for the uh, decentralization. It means that smaller participants are going to have bursts of improportionate uh, um, effect on how the consensus goes, um, and we don't want that. And this is achieved by a uh, high BPS. And the third property, scalability. So first of all, it means a high TPS. We just want to have a large throughputs. But more important, or equally as important, but uh, somewhat overlooked, is that we want to have short confirmation times. We want to be able to scale down how long you have to wait before you can consider a transaction um, spent uh, securely. So you get the Nakamoto guarantee that it's hard to revert. Okay, so, so far so good. Are there any questions? Any questions, folks? Okay, try to ask the questions in advance. Um, so I'm just gonna keep going. Um, and I'm gonna talk about previous attempts on the trilemma. I'm not, uh, they're not ordered here in a chronological order, but what I consider, a, let's say, order of sophistication. So, the first uh, thing is what uh, uh, a protocol called Tangle. It was the original protocol used by uh, IOTA. And it's essentially what uh, you can call it an inclusive ghost. Uh, I haven't said what ghost is. I rearranged the slides. And I, did. I didn't notice that I'm talking about ghost before saying what it is. But ghost is not ghost done. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about ghost later. It really isn't that important. But the point is that they try to take the ghost rule from Ethereum and make it inclusive in the sense that you also include all transactions in the uh, cousin blocks, in orphan blocks. And it turned out to be subject to liveness attacks. If you, we are gonna say exactly what a liveness attack is. Um, oh, I think I already have. It means that it's possible to indefinitely delay the resolution of a conflict. And if you ever heard that IOTA um, had to include in their network uh, centralized coordinators, it was for this reason, to prevent this kind of attack. Now they're working on Tangle 2, which is supposed to solve this. Um, as far as I remember, it's not proof of work. I don't know much about it. Um, the second attempt is Chainweb. Chainweb is not uh, exactly, uh, I would say, um, a, a consensus rule. It's more like a technique to take several independent chains and glue them together such that while each chain operates independently, you still have to attack all chains together. In order to revert a transaction, you have to be, um, you have to be as strong as the work put in all of the chains combined, which is kind of cool. And the problem with chain web is that Still, each chain, independent chain has a poor TPS, like traditional uh, Ethereum-like uh, TPS and confirmation times. And it also, since each chain is independent, if you want to work on several chains, you have to uh, transfer 
your uh, coin from one chain to the other and uh, it causes uh, a lot of problems. So it's like a halfway solution. Um, another uh, known solution is conflux. They uh, do something which you could uh, call a stochastic ghost. Uh, essentially the DAG, they do create a DAG, but it's layered into epochs. Like right? you have these time slots and only after the epoch ends can you um, go through the DAG and solve uh, conflicts and uh, see what's going on. And so it gives you high TPS, but it doesn't downscale confirmation times. Um, another progress uh, on that is um, approaches of shardless parallel chains like OHI and PRISM and PRISM++. The idea is that there are many chains uh, operating concurrently, um, but they all uh, work on the same state. Essentially, you, had, you can do the same transaction on this chain or on that chain, and every so often you see uh, voter blocks which are used, which belong to uh, several chains and are used to, um, to resolve conflicts. Um, this approach of shardless parallel chain indeed manages to downscale time, uh, downscale confirmation times with the network latency. But the problem is that it has a poor constants. Um, in practice, I think the fastest one is PRISM++, which gives confirmation times of about uh, I think five to seven minutes. And then you have Spectre. Spectre is a protocol also by uh, uh, Sompolinsky and Zohar. And it does manage to achieve everything we want. It upscales the TPS and it downscales confirmation times. And it even has this magical parameterlessness property, which I'll talk about um, at the very end, which means that it reacts to network latency, which sounds amazing on all parts, but the problem with Spectre is that it doesn't provide a total order. There is, um, if, as long as block two blocks are not conflicting, then they could appear on different orders, on different nodes, the order can even uh, revert much longer uh, after a lot of time retroactively. So Spectre has all these wonderful properties, but because of this non-total order, it can't provide um, any uh, complex functionality. It could only be a transaction layer, which is too limiting. And uh, that's why we, we didn't go with it. And I think this slide uh, sums up pretty nicely the state of the art so far. I've thrown in a lot of uh, um, concepts like uh, conflict resolution, epochs, ghost. I'm gonna go over them as we go. I just wanted to give you some picture of uh, the landscape of, uh, of trilemma solving attempts before a uh, ghost that appeared. Are you gonna go over confirmation times? Cause I got a question on how do you measure confirmation times? So essentially how do you measure confirmation times is uh, you need some um, way to some way to say that if you wait this and this seconds or blocks, then you have this level of security that the transaction is not going to revert. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about confirmations and uh, how do you measure confirmation times and security, specifically about ghost DAG, but it's going to take a little while because we first have to familiarize ourselves with that. Now, the thing is that um, confirmations is a rather subjective um, subjective term. There isn't like this criterion. Now the transaction is confirmed and now it's not. The fact is that the longer you wait, if, if your protocol is any good, then the longer you wait, the more security you get. The, more, the stronger is the guarantee that the transaction is not going to revert. And the question is how long are you gonna have to wait? And this, the answering these questions very much depends on how the protocol actually works. So in order to talk about the confirmation times in each of the protocols I mentioned, we'd have to go into how each and every one of them works and uh, that's not reasonable. So you, you can either take my word or uh, go uh, uh, do your own research about these protocols. I'm just stating the facts as I know them. So, now we're gonna talk about the block DAG paradigm. 
And the block deck paradigm is, um, um, I wouldn't say an extension, it's more like a substitute for the blockchain paradigm. So let's start with that. In the blockchain paradigm, each block points to a single block, its parent. And we want to isolate from this uh, tree of blocks a particular chain of blocks. Um, and how do we do that? We need to find some chain selection rule. We need to say that if there are parallel blocks, which of them we take and which of them we throw away. Uh, in Bitcoin, the rule we use is what's called the heaviest chain rule. We're just looking for the chain the, whose accumulated work is as much as possible. Now, I'm going to say this just once. I'm talking about heaviest because it's important for each, not just to count blocks, but for each block to be aware of how much work was put into it. Because it's very easy to create very, very long chains with um, very little work. Because the, if you make the chain yourself at home, you just don't have any difficulty adjustment, you don't have any retargeting. And so it's very important not just to look at how many blocks there are, but how much work was put into producing each block. And, but from now on, I'm going to ignore this. I am going to work in this comfortable setting where um, all of the blocks took the same amount of work to create. And the block, and, uh, the block creation rate is just uh, okay magically. Um, everything I say can be translated to this setting where we are also take into account the, um, the weight of the blocks so or how much work was put into each block in a very straightforward way. So I'm just going to ignore this aspect from now for simplicity. Uh, Ethereum uses the ghost rule uh, by Sompolensky and Zohar. Um, ghost stands for greedy heaviest observed subtree. What does this scary thing mean? It means that when you look at the chain, you don't take into account only the weight of the blocks on the chain, but you look at blocks that are near the chain. So I'm going to take into account the work on these blocks, but I'm also going to take into account the work on this block and this block, which are very close to the chain, but only partially. I'm going to give them less weight. And the further the block is, the less weight I'm going to give to this block. And this allows me, uh, in some sense, to also take into account the work done by blocks that weren't included. But this sense is uh, kind of limited. And this is where I was supposed to justify this statement by the slide with all of the state of the art, where we see that if we try to also use the ghost approach to include the transactions in these blocks that weren't included, we run into a lot of problems. So now we go from the blockchain paradigm to the block DAG paradigm. So the only difference between the chains and the DAGs is that in DAGs, each block is allowed to point at a lot of other blocks. And in the block DAG paradigm, we assume that any block points to all known tips. So I try to illustrate it here. This block, you could say that the, the tips are all the blocks that the miner was aware of when he created the block that weren't already pointed by another block. So we see that this block would point to this block and this block. It wouldn't point to this block because it's not a tip. And I'm, I will have to justify why a miner would do it. Why, what incentivizes a miner to follow this rule, but this will come a bit later. For now, we assume this. And what we want to do is to find a secure ordering rule. What this means is we don't want to isolate a chain and throw away the rest. We want to take all of these blocks and decide on some order of the blocks. This is the first one, the second one, the third one, etc., etc. Why is it good? Because once we have this ordering rule, we can say, okay, take the transactions from all the blocks. But if we see a transaction which conflicts a transaction on a preceding block, we can throw it away. So like, say we have this block, and then this block, and then this block. If this block pays some money to Alice and this block pays the same money to Bob, the money is going to go to Alice because this block was before this block in the ordering. 
Note that we don't throw away blocks for conflicts, we only throw away the conflicting transactions. And okay, so what is a good ordering rule? It has to be in consensus. This means that if we have two different people on the network which have no, are aware of the same blocks and they calculate the ordering, they're gonna get the same ordering. The ordering only depends on the data encapsulated inside the DAG. It has to be rapidly convergent. This means that if we have very similar but not identical DAGs, because there are some blocks that I've already heard of and you didn't, and there are some blocks that you have already heard of and I didn't, then still our ordering is going to be very, very similar. The, the differences are going to be only at the very top. And it has to be secure in the sense that I said before, that you can't do double spends or uh, you can't do liveliness attacks where you um, indefinitely delay the resolution of a conflict. It has to be incremental or efficient. You have to be able to compute this thing uh, using a reasonable hardware. Uh, it has to be um, performed in a reasonable time. It can't be an intractable uh, algorithm. And it has to be rational. Uh, when I say rational, I mean that if we have an honest but profit uh, maximizing miner, that is, it's a miner who wants to make as much money by, uh, from block rewards and fees, but they don't ha have any intention of interfering with the network intentionally, then they will follow the rule from before. They will point only at all of the tips they know. Okay, questions so far? I'm not seeing any, but can you elaborate what an, a tip is? Uh, okay, sure. So say we are in this situation. Uh, I'm also gonna add another block here. And um, so it would be more interesting. So say I'm a miner and now I want to create a block um, and I want to point at some existing blocks because each block can point at some other blocks. A tip would be a block that doesn't have any other block pointing to it already. So this is not a tip, right? Because this block is pointing at it. This also is not a tip. In this picture, there are exactly two tips. These two blocks. Why? Because these are the only two blocks that don't, don't have any other block pointing at them. You can say that they are the newest blocks in some sense. Okay? Makes sense. So tip equals leaf is what somebody says. Um, I wouldn't... Okay, if you... Like, a leaf is usually a term uh, used when talking about trees, and this is not a tree. Uh, it's... It's roughly, it's roughly correct. It's uh, correct enough for you. If it's comfortable for you to think about this, then uh, like this, then uh, go ahead. Okay. Looks good. Okay, now how do I unpin? Come on, man. Okay. So now that we know what the problem is, and maybe you've heard uh, Jonathan say a few times, Dugs are not a solution, dugs are a problem. This is what he meant. We have this structure of blocks that point at many other blocks and we create this uh, structure called a DAG. And the problem is to find a way to order it. And the solution is ghost DAG. But before I'm gonna talk about ghost DAG, I'm gonna talk about Phantom. Phantom is an idealized version of Ghost Dog, which is very easy to understand, or rather easy to understand, but impossible to implement in practice. And Ghost Dog is the solution to that problem. And so the Phantom insight is that blocks created by an honest network should be well connected. A lot of blocks should be aware of each other. There shouldn't be a block in the honest network, which is not aware to many, many other blocks. So um, here in this uh, drawing, we see this, that if we look at the blue blocks, then the block J knows all of the blocks except I and F. 
and the block C knows all of the blocks in, uh, except B and D, and I'm ignoring the red blocks for now. Um, when I say that a block knows other block, I mean that there is a path from this block to that block. So like A and F know each other because there is a path from F to A. Now, if I look at this, Red blocks, we see that there are many blocks that K doesn't know. K doesn't know G, C, B, F, I, and J. Um, and this means that this set of red blocks is in some set not well connected to this set of blue blocks. Um, so the rough idea is to look for large chunks of blocks which are highly connected and consider these blocks honest blocks, blocks created by the honest network. And then when you choose an ordering, you give precedence to these blue blocks and you delay the red blocks as much as possible. Now, obviously when I order, I can't uh, say put, I can't put uh, E after J. J has to come after E because J points at E. We need to preserve this uh, property that our ordering respects like time. But other than that, I can I can delay E as much as possible. I can put A and then I can put D and C and B and G and I and F. And only when I get to J, I say, ah, I have to put E first. And then E, even though it points directly at A, because it's poorly connected, it's going to appear much, much later in the ordering. And any transactions on E, if they conflict any transactions on the honest chunks, they won't be accepted. So there isn't a risk that these poorly connected blocks will um, interfere with what transactions are considered valid. And so I said well connected, um, and the mathematical notion we use for measuring connectedness is what we call a K cluster. And this K is very important. It's gonna, um, it's gonna be with us for the rest of the lecture, uh, up until um, Dagnite. Who we, you can say the great thing about Dagnite is that it allows us to not need this K anymore. Um, so a, a K cluster means that um, any block is parallel to at most K blocks. It means that any block would know any other block except maybe k blocks. So a zero cluster is a chain. Why is it a chain? Because say I okay, say I have on a block, then and that's an ugly block. I can't have two blocks pointing at it, right? Because this block would not know this block, but I said that this is a zero cluster. Every block has to know any other block. And the only structure which achieves this is a chain. Um, now, if we look at this drawing, now um, ignore the red blob for now. If the look, we look at this entire drawing, if you go over it carefully, you could convince yourself that this is a six cluster. Why? Because if we look, for example, uh, on this block, then it doesn't know these six blocks. This one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. All of them um, are oblivious in this block and vice versa. And if you go carefully, you'll see that the six is like the maximum number. There isn't any block which is oblivious to seven blocks. So this is why this is a six cluster. Now, if we look at the uh, red blob, only inside the red blob, then you can calculate that this is a three cluster. Because if you look at this block, then it is oblivious to these three blocks, this triangle here. And this is, again, the max, maximum you can get. You wouldn't get any block which is oblivious to more than three blocks inside this red blob. So this is the notion of a K cluster. It's a very important notion, and I want to make sure everybody got it. Nate? Everybody got that? Yep, we look good. Great, so let's keep going. So the phantom ordering is very simple. 
There is this parameter k, I'm not gonna talk about k right now, later I'm gonna elaborate on what this k is and how we choose it. And so we're looking for a maximal subset of the graph which is a k cluster. We want these big blobs of, of big uh, blob of blocks as large as possible with the property that any block in this blob knows all other blocks in this blob except maybe k blocks. Um, and we call these uh, blocks, I should have written this, we call the elements inside this block the blue blocks. If you ever heard of red blocks and blue blocks in Casper, that, then that's essentially it. This maximal sub-k cluster, this big um, uh, well-connected group is the blue blocks. And once we have them, we just choose any ordering which respects time. And I, if k, if a is in the uh, past of b, um, then I can't put a before b. I'll have to put it uh, after b. That's the first rule. But other than that, we're gonna always give precedence to the the blue blocks. We're only going to put red blocks in the ordering when we have to. Um, Okay, so he, here I said that the elements inside this subcluster are the blue blocks and the rest we call them the red blocks. And if we go back to um, this drawing, then we see that this thing, this chunk of blocks here is a, a, is a three cluster or a two cluster, I actually didn't check, and it is the largest one. Uh, if I try to add any blocks from the red blocks, then now I have a block which violates this property. So the phantom ordering would first know, uh, my, uh, color these blocks blue, and then it would order them in a way which um, puts off using the red blocks for uh, as long as possible. Now, the way we choose, it, there are many orderings that satisfy this property, and the exact way we choose this uh, ordering it doesn't really matter as long as we give some, it's, it's deterministic enough so everyone in the network will choose the same ordering. So this is the phantom ordering and it seems nice. It's kind of a straightforward and easy to understand, but the only problem is that it's completely intractable. The problem of actually finding a maximal K cluster, um, it is uh, NP hard. Um, if you don't know what NP hard means, it essentially means that uh, if you manage to solve it, then you broke down computer science. Right? Most chances are that there is no solution for this problem. So we want to find a similar problem, which is actually computable efficiently. And this is the ghost duck protocol. The ghost duck protocol is a greedy variation of the phantom protocol. Um, it's more complicated, um, and it doesn't actually find a K-cluster. It finds a blue set which is sufficiently close for a K-cluster um, for the protocol to be secure. And the way it works is um, uh, recursively. For each block, we are going to have something which, call, which is called a blue score. What is the blue score of a block? Uh, it's just the number of blue box, blocks in the past of this block. I'm gonna uh, go over this description of ghost duck and then I'm gonna go in detail into this picture here and hopefully it will make sense. It's, it's a bit subtle, um, so if you don't get it right away, that's fine. Just uh, sit with it slowly and uh, go over the details yourself. Uh, but um, for now, um, just try to be with me. So for each block, we have this Thing called the blue score of the block, which is just the number of blue blocks in the past of this block. So again, if I go back to um, this drawing, then the blue score of J would be um, one, two, three, four, five, right? Because it has five blue blocks in its past. The E block is also in its past, but it doesn't contribute to the blue score. Um, and so now for each block, there are several parents, um, and then it, there is the selected parent. Which is the selected parent? You go over all of the parents, 
When I say a parent, I mean that a block it, uh, that it points to directly. The parents of K, for example, are B, H, and I. And of all the parents, the selected parent is the parents with the largest high score. Now, again, it's possible that you have two parents with largest high score, and then, again, it doesn't matter how you break the tie, as long as everyone breaks the tie in the same way. Um, just ignore this technicality. And now each block inherits the blue past of the selected parent. And then they only go over every, uh, the blocks they know that are not in the past of the selected parent and choose blocks from there. How do they do it? Again, it doesn't matter as long as everyone does it the same. And they try to pick as many blocks as possible. Uh, without violating the K cluster property. So um, I know this was a lot of details at once. So to understand this better, we're just going to go over this special case together slowly. So we are starting from the Genesis block. The Genesis block have, has no parents, has no past. So it has a blue score of zero, right? Now, we go over all of these blocks that point at the Genesis block, um, B, C, D, and E, and all of them has a blue score of one, right? Because all of them have exactly one blue block in their past, the Genesis block. Um, so we choose one of them arbitrarily. Um, in this example, we chose D. Okay, now, we are going to look at age. Maybe I should have said it before. We are trying to calculate the blue set of M, of the block M. And we are, and we are going backwards. So now we are looking at the block age. Um, and again, it has three parents, C, D, and E. And all of these parents have the same blue score. Why we are only looking at age? Because it's the only block that looks at D right now. And Again, um, C, D, and E all have the same blue score, so we are going to pick D arbitrarily to be the selected parent of H. Um, and then we keep going. Um, so at the third step, we are looking at K. And K, who's, who are the, uh, the parents of K? They are B, H, and I. And if we look, we see that I has a blue score of 2. B has a blue score of one, and H has a blue score of four. So we say, okay, our selected parent is H, but now we're gonna have to pick, um, look at B and look at I, and we want to choose um, some of them to be blue. Now, I should have said it in this example, K equals two, because K equals two, I can't consider B to be a blue block. Why? Because C and D and E are blue blocks, and B doesn't know neither C or D or E. So considering B as a blue block would break the um, two-cluster property. However, I can add consider I to be a blue block. Why? Because the only blue block I doesn't know is age. So adding I to my set of blue blocks doesn't break the K cluster property. Um, and then we keep going. Now we look at M. And again, M has two parents, K and F. F has a blue score of three. K has a blue, blue score of six. And, and because of that, K is the selected parent. And now we look at all of the blocks um, that are not in the past of K, but that M knows, uh, which is exactly one block. It would be F. And we note that we can't add F to the blue set. Why? Again, because it doesn't know H, K, and I. All of them are blue blocks. So F has more than three, uh, two blue blocks it doesn't know. So we can, can't consider F to be blue, etc., etc. And we'll just finish with V. V is like the virtual block. It's, it's a block that uh, doesn't actually exist. It's just like this imaginary blocks that points at all of the known tips and we use it just to calculate the ordering and v looks at all the tips l m and j we see that j has a blue score of m of six 
L has a blue score of 4, M has a blue score of 7, so M would be the selected parent. And now, if we look at uh, the blocks that are in the past of V, but not in the past of M, we see there are two of them, there is L and there is J, but we can't add J to the blue set because it doesn't know K, it doesn't know M, it doesn't know I. So there's three blue blocks that J doesn't know that would break the property, but we can add L because there are only... Um, wait, I think that's a... Okay, I think either that's a mistake or it's with K equals three because I see that L is marked as blue. I think, oh, I'm sorry, I think K equals three here. If we add L, then um, it doesn't know only H, K, and M, so it's only three, so it's fine. Uh, actually, I ha I'll have to go back and check, but this is essentially how it works. Um, um, but it works recursively. When we come to calculate the blue set of V, we assume that the blue sets of M, J, and L were already calculated, and then we can work recursively. So this is essentially how it works. Um, and just uh, to see how to see this live, um, if we go to the KGI, then we see that. Uh, do you see the KGI? You see my uh, uh, browser? Yep, we can see it. Okay, cool. So you can see the the dog accumulates, and we are we are not seeing any red blocks right now because red blocks uh, happen kind of rarely, um, for reasons uh, I'll talk about in a little bit. But we can see um, that um, from each block we have this um, blue bold arrow pointing outside, and this is the selected parent. Essentially, if I look at this block and this block, and then Either they have the same score and we use the tiebreaker, which I think what, uh, is what happens now. Um, but if, we, if you look uh, well enough, then you will see that there is one block pointing to many blocks and one of them will have a, a better blue score than the other and this would be the selected parent. Now, to, if we do want to see a more interesting scenario, then we could look at, oh, just one last thing, uh, a fact is that this, um, this recursive step of choosing the K blocks, it can be done efficiently. It, uh, its complexity grows quadratically with K. So as long as K is not huge, we're fine. And this picture is from Testnet from a few days ago. What happened here is that some people were gladly chugging along the testnet using their CPUs. And then uh, we think that someone just decided to turn on a GPU rig on the testnet without warning anyone. And the result was that uh, his hash rate was so much larger than the entire networks that uh, he started creating like uh, 40 or 50 blocks per second, which is much more than should happen. And uh, in that time, we did get to see a lot of red blocks um, because I think K is 18 right now. And you see, um, uh, huge like sets of much more than 18 blocks that non don't know each other. So this is what the um, K cluster looks like when you have way too many blocks, just for illustration. Can we go back uh, to the KGI real quick, the visualizer? Yeah. Okay, so somebody asked, can you, can you explain or determine K cluster with us? Like, can we um, so we person? don't really calculate a K cluster, we calculate an approximate K cluster, and the K cluster is essentially all the blocks that are marked blue. Um, and here it's not very interesting because K is about is 18, if I remember correctly, and you don't really see blocks that aren't aware of 18 blocks. Every block in this drawing um, is uh, aware to all blocks except three or four or five, and this happens almost all of the time, we'd have to sit and wait a very long time to see a red block, okay? And now the reason for that is that we have to take a margin of error. The, the K we have to use is, we can't use the most optimal K because um, we have to take a margin of error in, in case that there is a deterioration in the network 
um, uh, conditions, and this is why we use k equals 18, while you see that most of the time k equals 3 or 4 is just fine, and this is also the reason why we'd have to wait a very long time um, if we hope to see a red block. So right now, the question is, if I can see what the k cluster is, the k cluster is all of the blocks. Okay, and but... then the... The thick blue line, is it safe to say that's the heaviest chain? It's not exactly the heaviest chain. It just said that um, if I look at a particular block, then the blue arrow would point at the, ch at the heaviest child. Gotcha. Okay. It's Why? not exactly the same as choosing the heaviest chain. Um, there, is, there are examples where the selected chain and the heaviest chains are not the same. But we, I really don't want to go into this. Um, okay, so I talked about efficiency. Um, I haven't uh, talked about why this thing is secure yet, um, but I do want to talk about uh, rationality. So I'll just remind you that the property I called rationality is that a miner, uh, a rational miner, which wants to maximize profit, would in fact, do what we said, would in fact point towards all of the um, tips. Why would a miner do that? In practice, a miner is incentivized not to point at a lot of blocks because pointing at a lot of blocks would make his block heavier. Also, if the, um, if the difficulty becomes harder and harder, then why would I point at tips which give me a lot of difficulty where I can point much lower in the, I can point directly at the genesis and have no difficulty at all. So why would I follow this rule? So the solution to that, um, now, and now this is an example of a place where I go outside the scope of, um, of the consensus layer. Um, and the thing is about how we distribute the rewards. And the point is that if your block is red, you don't get a reward. So who is going to get a reward? Um, so the reward will go to the first block in the selected chain, in this chain of blue arrows, which knows your block. This is called the merging block. Um, and uh, note, it's not, it's not going to go to the first blue block that, uh, that uh, knows your block. It has to be the selected chain block. And why? What is the consequence of this rule? Um, so one consequence is that you are incentivized to put a point at many edges, uh, many tips, which increase your blue block. Why? Because this would increase your chances to be on the chain. And you want to be on the chain because then you get the reward for red blocks. And you also have incentives to point at tips that do not increase your blue score because that means that you would have more red blocks in your past and then if you are in the chain you're gonna get more rewards. So to sum it up, uh, you want to point at blocks that give you more blue past because it increases your chance to win the rewards for red blocks and you want to point at the other blocks because it increases the reward you will get if you are in the selected chain. So these things combined um, gives miners an incentive to point at all the tips. Okay. Okay. So in in the case of the incentive, like I'm sure there's some miners out there. What is the incentive? Do they actually get physically more rewards, or is it just a better chance to get the rewards? So okay. Um, maybe I'll do a little drawing here. Um, so, okay, I, I don't think a drawing will do. Um, think about it this way. You point at tips. Now, when you point at tip, it could be uh, have two uh, consequences. One is that you, uh, the tip and the blocks below it, some of them will be blue. And then your blue score increases. You have more chances to be a selected parent and to be on the selected chain. And if you point at tips that don't give you blue blocks, then what happens is that you have more red blocks in your past. Okay, um, 
I like to think about it as the blue box, the blue blocks in your past um, increases your chance to win, to be on the selected chain, uh, which is um, an incentive to point at them. And the red blocks uh, increase your, uh, the reward you get in case you win. Now, if your block is blue, then you get the reward whether you are on the selected chain or not. The point is whether you are going to win the rewards for the red blocks, you know. Gotcha. This is the incentive. Makes sense. Cool. So now I'm going to talk about ghost tag security. And like before, you, you'll notice that I draw a lot of parallels to Bitcoin because we always say that ghost dog is a very gentle um, generalization of Bitcoin and a lot of the reasoning we do um, are actually to take classical arguments known about Bitcoin and find a way to extend them to ghost dog. And it works very well, not just because ghost dog is a DAG, uh, but because it's really a generalization of Bitcoin. If you take K equals zero, you get, you recover the original Nakamoto consensus in a way. And we want to just take these arguments and increase them to more general values of K. So, uh, as I said, what is security? It means that a 49% attacker, and again, the 49% here is with an asterisk, because as I said, you get to decide um, how close to half the attacker has to be. But a sufficiently uh, weak attacker can't revert a transaction and can't delay conflict resolution. Now, um, a nice exercise is to note that if you manage to prove that Bitcoin is double spend secure or any other chain selection rule is double spend secure, then this chain selection rule also has liveness because once you chose a chain, there is no conflict to resolve. And the only way to double spend is to change a chain. So if the attacker, attacker can't change the chain, then it also, they also can't delay conflict resolution. Think about it. It's not very hard to formalize this. Um, this claim. The thing is that this thing is not true for DAG protocols. Recall the cautionary tale I told about IOTA, which does have this Nakamoto consensus uh, property that you can't revert a transaction, but you can delay conflict resolution, and that turns out to be very detrimental. Um, but I do want to talk about the security of Bitcoin and how one would prove it. And before, I just want to state what the security is. So the security of Bitcoin relies on two parameters. One is lambda, is the block delay. It's how long you wait between two blocks. And this is 10 minutes. Uh, on average, if we, if we ignore uh, changes to difficulty, then on average, there is a Bitcoin block once every 10 minutes. And D is the block round trip time, how long it takes the entire network to learn of a newly created block. And the security theorem of Bitcoin uh, stated informally is that if Lambda is much larger than D, then Bitcoin is secure against 49% attacks. Um, I can make it a bit more concrete. I'm saying that Bitcoin is secure against an almost half adversary. It's half times one minus delta. But the thing is that delta goes to one, meaning that the security goes to zero very, very fast if lambda goes to D. If we try to take the block delay and make it shorter and shorter and shorter, and it becomes more and more similar to the round trip time, then the security deteriorates very fast. So you don't have to be even very close. If you try to do Bitcoin on 30 seconds, then you're going to see problems. And the thing is that the, this condition, the lambda is much stronger than, much larger than D condition. The reason it's important because it prevents orphan blocks. Thing is that sometimes, it, even if lambda is huge, every so often, two honest blocks are going to be created at the same time. And then, the chain selection rule is going to prefer one of them over the other and the other block is going to go to the garbage and not contribute 
to the weight of the honest chain. So for example, um, in the current parameters of Bitcoin, uh, as far as I know, we get this once every 150 blocks. Um, uh, one in every 150 blocks gets opened and gets thrown away. So if I want to double spend a tech Bitcoin, I don't have to create as many blocks as the Honest Network. I only have to create 149 blocks for every 150 blocks the network creates because I know that some of them are gonna get thrown away. Now that's not really a problem because that's close enough to have. But the thing is that if I'm going to increase the block rate more and more and more, I'm gonna see more and more and more orphans and then an more work will go to the garbage and an attacker will have to work less hard to double spend on the network. And now Ghost allows us to partially relax this. Uh, you could say that asymptotically it's the same, but it gives you a much better constant. Um, and this is the reason that Ethereum is on one hand faster, but on the other hand, it's still limited. The block times are still still have to be somewhat larger than the round trip times. And we can say that this lambda uh, has to be much larger than D is essentially um, encapsulates what's called the blockchain scalability issues. This is the reason why blockchains don't scale. Okay, so what about ghost deck? So recall the parameter K from before. I haven't said now we're gonna understand a bit about how this K is chosen. So this is a theorem um, proven in the ghost tag paper. Um, uh, it's a theorem by uh, Jonathan Sompolinski and me and Aviv Zohar. And it for informally says the following. If we choose K such that the following two things happen. One is that most of the time, one minus delta of the time, there are at most K parallel blocks. So say delta is like uh, 2%, then I'm saying 98% of the times, we are not gonna see um, more than K blocks produced which uh, do not know each other. And there is another mild condition that I'm not gonna get into. Um, it actually relates to what I said earlier that the heaviest chain and the selected chain are not exactly the same. Um, don't worry about this, the only, thing that you need to know is that it doesn't increase K by a lot at all. It's, it's kind of a negligible. Um, but if we have these two conditions hold, then the network is secure against a, um, wine, a half times wine minus delta attacker. So if I choose delta to be 2%, so, um, for example, then I'm gonna be secure against a 49% attacker. Um, now K, okay. Uh, how do I compute K? I'm not going to say exactly. Um, there is a computation to choose a K that satisfies this. Um, it's a function of D, of delta, and of uh, lambda, that is of the network latency or some bound of the network latency and um, the uh, amount of security I want to guarantee and the block delay. And the reason we even need proof of is to enforce that the block delay is what we assume it to be. And now the thing of note here is that nowhere in this theorem I had to uh, require anything about the relation between lambda and D. This protocol decouples them. It could be secure even when lambda is smaller than D. In fact, lambda and D can do whatever they want. And as long as K is large enough, then there is no problem. This is the reason why ghost tag scale where Bitcoin doesn't. Okay. Um, so just I'll say uh, for concreteness that in practice we use D of 10 seconds, a delta of 5% and lambda of one second, which imply uh, K equals 18 and uh, Nakamoto security against 47.5% uh, attackers. So a good question to ask now is why don't just choose K to be huge? Why? Because it seems that 
if k is large, then things are good, because if I choose k to be a million, then this condition will definitely hold. So the thing is that there is a tension here. We want to choose k large enough, but not too large, just, just large enough. Um, for two reasons. One is, if you'll recall earlier, I said that the runtime of the incremental step is quadratic in k. So if k is huge, then the algorithm would become inefficient. And the second is that, uh, as we'll see, it causes, um, it increases the confirmation times of the network. As larger k means you'd have to wait longer to, to be secure. And the issue, intuition for that is essentially that um, if you choose k equals million, then the attacker can do whatever they want for like 900,000 blocks and they would still be connected enough. You'd have to wait for a million and one blocks before you say, okay, if there was a side attack, then it, would be, it wouldn't be connect, sufficiently connected. So this is the tension of why you want k to be as small as possible, but still large enough. Um, okay, any questions? Uh, no, uh, there's some, but I think JWJ is helping them with a separate. Uh, I wanted to just say that that last slide was amazing. That really actually tied a lot of the math together for me because I am, I mean, I got a decent coverage of math, but you know, when it comes to symbols and stuff I don't recognize, it gets a little hairy, but this really cleared it up. I love this. Great. Um, I'm very glad to hear this is the entire purpose of this thing, to demystify a lot of uh, what's going on under the hood. Okay. So, again, drawing an analogy, we want to prove the security of GhostDAG. We are going to first talk about how one proves the security of Bitcoin. And the proof, the security proof uh, of Bitcoin, um, I think it's also by uh, Zohar and Sampolinsky. It's a hard proof. It's a highly non-trivial proof for reasons I'm not going to get into. I'm just going to say what's the gist of it, because even though it's a complicated proof, because it requires, for reasons, for very good reasons, it requires kind of heavy mathematical tools uh, called martingales, um, the intuition to, to it ca can be explained uh, in a very uh, elementary and nice uh, illustrative way. So consider this situation that we have an attacker, a less than half attacker. Right now I'm ignoring all of these uh, delta things. Um, I'm just gonna assume that, uh, that uh, there are no orphan blocks and, and the, all of the honest blocks are arranged in a perfect chain. Again, if if that's not quite the case, then you'd have to have a smaller alpha, but right now I ignore this. And, and now the attacker needs to create a longer chain, right? But the thing is that it doesn't suffice to just create two blocks in the time it takes the network to create one block, right? Because you have to wait for confirmations. In Bitcoins, like if you are stringent, you are waiting for six confirmations or for small transaction you would wait two confirmations or three confirmations uh, there is this list of uh, recommended waiting times uh, according to how much money is in your transaction um, so we can think of this is what we call a random walk on z now um, when i first prepared this slide it was more meant for mathematicians so i'm just gonna um, translate this to to yeah, human needs um, z is just integers it's like all the positive and neg uh, negative uh, uh, numbers. Um, and you can think about it as a person that stands on the number zero. And every time this person, this drunk person, either takes a step to the left or to the right. And the probability that they take a step to the right is alpha. The probability that they take a step to the left is one minus alpha. So why am I giving you this silly story about a drunk person? Because you can think about this drunk person as the advantage the attacker has on the, um, on the honest chain. Every time the attacker manages to create a block, which happens with probability alpha, then it increases by one. And every time the honest network manages to create a block, it decreases by one. So 
if we are waiting for n confirmations, that means that being able to double spend is the same as the probability that this drunkard manages to go to a positive number after there has been at least n steps in the negative um, direction. So like in Bitcoin, we are waiting for six confirmation. It means that um, at least six steps to the left have been made. This means that we've waited for six confirmations, but somehow at some point in the future, we have managed to arrive at a positive number, um, which is uh, akin to saying that at some point in the future, the attacker chain was longer than the, um, the original, um, the, the honest chain. So I'm just gonna say that this has a probability which looks like this. It's uh, <laughs> alpha minus one over alpha to the n. Um, so uh, the math might be a bit scary, but what you need to know is that if alpha is smaller than half, then this thing, alpha over minus one minus alpha is smaller than one. So you have this number which is smaller than one and then you take a power of it. It means that the probability that it's gonna happen is actually, it's what we call exponentially small. And in Bitcoin, we usually go for n equals six. Uh, if you do the math, you'll see that even if you have like a 40% attacker, here you will have then a four over six or two thirds, and then you take it to the power of six and you'll see that this turns out to be a very small number. It's small enough so that you would consider this safe. So this is uh, in a nutshell why Bitcoin is secure. And so, as I said, the actual proof is much harder. The reason for that is that in my proof, I kind of assumed that the attacker only starts to attack the chain um, in order to reverse the transaction uh, pretty much where the transaction was made, maybe one block before. But in reality, the attacker can start cultivating the attack like a year before, or like 10 years before, whenever they want. So I have to somehow take into account all of these possibilities together, and this requires some uh, heavy machinery. You can't do it with the elementary probability theory. Um, but the gist is the same, just requires some more sophisticated tools to, to quantify and formalize this, uh, this argument. So now we want to take this nice um, argument and we want to extend it from Bitcoin to GhostDuck. Um, and the problem is a phenomenon called freeloading. Um, and freeloading is the fact that the attacker can point to honest block to increase their blue score. So if we go a lot back, um, we look at this block uh, K, we know that even though the attacker only created E and agent K, this block K does have some blue score, right? Because it knows D and it knows A. So, um, the honest network would think that this block still has a score of two. Uh, these are blocks created by the attacker, but their score is boosted by the blocks created by the honest network. So we can't use this, um, this block race um, uh, argument again. We can say that either there is a right transition, like there is a step in the favor of the attacker when the attacker creates a block and there is a step against the attacker when the honest network creates blocks because the honest network can also help the attacker. So how, why are we secure? Why this ability to, to leech off the, the honest network doesn't enable an attack for much smaller attackers, like 10% attackers, 5% attackers. Um, and I would say that this very point, this possibility, this ability of an attacker, of an adversary, a double spending adversary to freeload is what makes security of DAGs that much more complicated. But lucky for us, GhostDAG is an amazing protocol which has a special property. Um, it's what we call the freeloading lemma. Uh, it was proven by Jonathan Sampolinsky and myself. And it says that 
even though an attacker can freeload, it's limited in how much it can freeload. It can freeload as much... It can't freeload more than K blocks when they try a double spend attack. And if they try a liveness attack, they can do a little bit more, but uh, only up to 4K blocks and uh, not above it. And note that this thing is constant because K uh, is fixed. We choose it in advance. And I carefully say, I'm not sure this is the case. Uh, Michael can beat me up later if I'm wrong, but I think that one of the... Uh, difficulties in proving the security of Gosdag was the fact that since this K doesn't exist or is not fixed, then the advantage of an attack is, attacker is also not fixed, and uh, this is this makes uh, all of the argumentation that much more difficult. So I'm not going to prove the freeloading lemma. The, anyone can read the proof in the paper, and um, but the intuition is essentially that. If you're trying to gain more than K or 4K um, um, weight from the network, then you would eventually um, see that one of the blocks of the honest networks become your selected parent. Um, so actually you agree with the honest network. And so it's no longer an attack. Even if you cultivate this chain and post your blocks, then you agree with the honest network and you don't revert the transaction anymore. So um, it doesn't help you. As long as you want to leech off the honest network in a way that your chain still prefers the transaction, the conflicting transaction that you're trying to replace from the honest network, and then you wouldn't be able to gain more than this constant advantage. And so and the upshot of this is that for optimal security, which is similar to say security of six blocks in Bitcoin, you want to wait K, for K plus N blocks when N is sufficiently large. N is like the six in Bitcoin, but it's going to be a bit higher here. And if you want security similar to like three blocks in Bitcoins, then waiting K over two blocks is enough. And all of this is assuming you haven't seen a conflict. When you see a conflict, things become more of a problem. But the thing is that an adversary can create a conflict for an honest user. The only way a conflict happens is if the owner of the money tries to double spend it. So as long as the user, not the miner, is honest, then you wouldn't see a conflict even if there is an attacker. Um, uh, in practice, um, uh, this turns out to be 50 confirmations for high value transactions. Say uh, if you want to now pay like uh, uh, 50 million Casper or something like that, uh, a lot of money, then uh, you should wait like for 50 confirmations. But for every day, use the 10 confirmations is uh, more than enough. So real um, quick, um, mm -hmm. the infamous, uh, the DAGs are the problem, not the solution. Is this stemming mm -hmm. from what makes DAGs difficult on this slide? No, the infamous DAGs is a problem, not a solution, is that just saying you, you, you're you using a DAG doesn't mean anything. A DAG is just the fact that a block can point to other blocks. Um, the, this, and the problem is the problem of coming up with an ordering which is secure. It's, a, it's much more, um, uh, I would say, general than this thing. And this is like the fine details of why this particular solution is secure. And DAX is a problem, it's just saying that you arrange your blocks in a DAG, so what? Now you have this problem of extracting and ordering in a secure way. This is the problem. The solution is a protocol like GhostDAG or Spectre or Dagnite or uh, any other solution. Great. That makes a lot of sense. Um... Okay. So what I said so far uh, explains why we are secure against double spend attacks. Um, but as I said, there is this thing called a uh, liveness attack. 
Um, so what the, before we talk about how we solve the problem of liveness attacks, we, I think I should show what a liveness attack looks like because it's not very intuitive. Um, and the starting um, situation in the, is this. When you have this uh, block and then you have two blocks pointing to it and they have conflicting transaction. Here I call them fee and neg fee to say that fee is some transaction and neg fee is some conflicting transaction. Say this, in these transactions I pay my money to Nate and in this transaction I pay the same UTXO to Michael. So which one of these is true? So we just wait for a block and we have this block here. The selected parent would be this block and not this block. So this block wins, right? Um, but now an attacker can do something like this. They can add weight purposefully to the, um, to the resolution that wasn't chosen. And then they can do the same on the other side. And the point is that they can keep doing this forever. Um, every time one side wins, we add weight to the other side and this way we delay the resolution forever. And this attack doesn't require a lot of processing of uh, computational power. It just uh, requires timing. Now, it's not easy or very practical to pull off this attack, um, but it is an attack vector that you uh, can't deny um, because in some cases it could be very detrimental. Um, and what can we do to prevent this attack? So the way we deal with them in CASPA, in the CASPA security argument, is through what we call an hourglass event. The point is that eventually there would be this, the, the honest network will create this burst of blocks that are uh, sufficiently arranged like a chain. And at this point, the attacker can't do this trick again. The attacker, um, if they try to add blocks here, it wouldn't matter because this thing has too much weight. And so they can't change the things anymore. And if now they still want to undo the resolution, now they have to win a block race like before. They have to create more blocks than here. And the network keeps churning out blue blocks here on top of this like hourglass. And the uh, adversary has to produce blocks faster than the honest net. So as long as there wasn't this kind of hourglass events, we can't be certain uh, how the conflict is going to resolve. But once it has appeared, then um, we can be sure that uh, we are fine because now the attacker, the complete computationally inferior attacker, again has to be faster than the honest network. And so this is how we deal with hourglass events. Uh, we, sorry, hourglass events is the way we deal with this kind of um, um, liveness attacks. Now I clarify once again that this is only relevant when a conflict is observed. So hourglass events, um, waiting conflict resolution does indeed require some more time than just waiting for a transaction to confirm. Um, but as long as the user spending the money is honest, then it's fine. And if the user spending the money is doing a double spend, then essentially they're only screwing themselves, right? Because then the, the receiver would see the conflict and they say, okay, now you could have made this purchase in 10 seconds, but now because you did this, you're going to have to wait longer. Um, so it's more of the spender's problem than the receiver's problem. Um, but uh, now I just have to say something about why this thing, this uh, hourglass thing, doesn't harm confirmation times. And why we have these fast confirmations that we love so much. And um, so the idea is that say we have two blocks, B and C, and say that these blocks are parallel in the sense that they don't know each other, and they created a time at the times t and t plus r. Like say t is like two o'clock and t plus r is two o'clock plus 10 seconds. And then what we have proved, this is also from the ghost dog paper, 
is that the probability that both of them are going to be blue uh, it decays exponentially as r uh, grows um, larger so remember that the ghost decoder in it prefers blue blocks so if if I see a blue block B with some transaction and then I wait for 10 seconds, I know that even if a conflict will appear after 10 seconds, the probability that C is going to be blue is negligibly small. Hence, I can ignore this option. I can say, okay, um, even if a conflict would appear, I know how it's going to get resolved because it would be on a red block. And this is why it is safe to consider a transaction completes, uh, confirmed fast as long as no conflict was witnessed. And even if a conflict would be posted later, it wouldn't matter. It still remains safe. Um, so this thing, this property, which is also not a trivial property, uh, but not too hard to understand, this is what makes Godstack the first fully scalable proof of work consensus. It's essentially the only proof of work where confirmation times are really, really, really scaled down as long as you don't witness a confirmation a conflict. And I would add that even if you do see a conflict, it's not that bad. Um, but this is essentially, I think, this slide kind of sums up where Godstack is better than uh, anything else already out there. So, uh, any questions so far? I have one uh, that might apply. It says, does the confirmation time only affect the conflicting transactions or the entire block? Um, it only affects the conflicting transactions. If you have, uh, um, if you see a conflicting transaction um, for one, if you see like uh, in one block a conflicting transaction and another block, and one block a transaction and a parallel block conflicting transaction, um, then the thing is that both blocks might be blue, so the ordering is indeterminate, but all of the other transactions in these blocks are not conflicting, so they don't care which of these blocks would eventually be before or after in the ordering, because they don't, the ordering of these two blocks doesn't affect whether the transactions, other than the conflicting transactions, are um, valid or not, because in either way, all of the non-conflicting transactions would be considered um, valid. Um, the only transaction at risk is the one where you have witnessed a uh, uh, conflict. Perfect, that makes sense. Okay. So uh, in practice, we look at the uh, R equals 10, as I said before. Um, okay. So at this point, we are done uh, with uh, talking about goes that as it appears in the paper and we start to go into what i'd say uncharted territories about we're going to start talking about stuff that are um oh sorry we're going to start talking about uh, stuff that are uh, less familiar and uh, right now don't have good sources for them i'm already i already see that we're going to go past the um two hours mark uh, so uh, hang on with me so what i'm going to talk about now is data pruning. So there is a storage issue. The faster your network operates, the faster data accumulates. Um, so if we say at full capacity, we run at one block per second and one megabyte per block, if we store all of this data, then this accumulates to uh, about 37 terabytes a year. Now that's not reasonable, for many reasons. Um, uh, one of the reasons is that purely um, um, hardware, um, hardware uh, barrier, we just don't want, we want this thing to run on a reasonable hardware, like on mid-tier home laptops. Uh, we can't expect them to have this amount of storage, but even if they did, this also causes the issue that you have this huge database with a lot of data that uh, accessing uh, very old data could become very slow and take everything down. So yeah, this is prohibitive. We can't operate this way. So the question is at hand is how can we remove all data securely? And this, this is divided into um, 
two types of data. It's essentially the block data, like the list of transactions and the block headers. And I'm going to discuss these two things uh, separately. Now, it might seem like um, an engineering issue, but there is actually a deep theory to this, as we'll see. And so, again, analogy to Bitcoin, how do we blo uh, prune block data? And so in, in blockchains, pruning the data, again, not headers, you keep all the headers for now and then uh, just throw the data. Um, erasing all data is, is, is not very complicated. You just say, let's erase everything which is, say, more than 20 hours old and just keep the UTXO set of the oldest store blocks. So you know what was the state um, at the oldest block you know, and you know all the rest of the blocks, so you can compute from it the current state for each block you get, and then you like prune data once every 24 hours, and everything is fine. And if you see a block that is pointing to a block whose data you already erased, you just chuck it away because you assume that you're not gonna see uh, reorgs which are more than 24 hours long. If you do see it, then you already have deeper problems and you need to stop everything and say, hey guys, there is this huge fork, what do we do? So I'm saying it's not that it's impossible, it's just that if this happens, then data storage is not your problem right now. You have other priorities. So you can say, you, you are allowed to say stuff like, just let's assume from now that we don't see this very, very, very deep reorg. Um, and then, as long as there aren't these uh, tw 24 hour deep splits, then this is just fine. Because um, you know, uh, now there, there is a small detail here that you take the hash of the UTXO set and you keep it on the block. So now what you see is the last 24 hours of blocks. You see the UTXO set of the oldest block and you can verify that it is, it's indeed the correct UTXO set. And then from that, you can just compute everything and everything is secure, even though you just keep constant amount of data. Okay, can you elaborate on what the data is and what a header is? The transactions themselves. Okay, it's and just, the header? The header is stuff like which point this block points to, it's the nonce, <laughs> and what was the difficulty target, so you could uh, calculate the hash of the block and to see that it's, uh, it actually satisfies the difficulty requirement. It's all data that isn't the transaction data itself. It's all the metadata requires to, to show that it's, it's a legitimate part of the chain. Like who is the parent, uh, what was the difficulty, uh, a miracle root of the transactions, etc., etc. Cool, perfect. So can we do this in block docs? Can we just say, okay, take any block which is like more than 24 hours old and throw it in the bin. So no, because say this is my DAG and I, uh, my DAG for now is a chain, but the point is I can do this, right? And in blockchain, I, uh, if I point at a very old block, it's not really a problem, right? Because I know this block that's pointing at a very old block is not gonna be in the selected chain and it's fine. But this is no longer the case in DAGs, right? Because this block, is now a tip, right? I can point at it. It's part of the DAG and the data therein might be useful. It might, uh, it might contain transactions which I would like to, to include in my state. Um, I can't just throw it away. Um, so the, like the most straightforward solution is say, Okay, can't you just say that you don't allow blocks to point too deep? And now the problem with this is what is too deep? Because the depth of the block you point at is no longer in consensus. It could be that this particular block... Uh, I have a laser pointer. It could be that this particular block is only known to half of the network, right? So if we say like this amount of block is too deep, and then I post this block here, then half of the network is gonna think that it's too deep and throw it away. 
and the other half of the network is going to say it's just shallow enough to be valid and not throw it away. So the upshot is that with a single block, I can split the entire network and create and make half of the network think the state is one thing and half of the network think that it's other. This is what we call a threshold attack. Essentially, thresholds are bad. Thresholds that rely on anything other than the structure of the DAG and like objective data, which is consistent for everyone, can split the network like that. And this is, a very, as you see, it's a very deadly attack. Again, think about it. An adversary posts one well-timed block and the network splits into two inconsistent states. This is incredibly bad. So how do we go about fixing this? How do we find a better solution? And so a first attempt would be what we called a, a bounded merge. Uh, what this means, we're saying, okay, this block is fine, but this block isn't. We don't allow a block to point at two blocks that are too far apart. We see that C uh, points, is, points at a very, very low place. But this other tip is much higher than C. Like this block and this block has very, very different blue scores. And we just say, no, you can't do this. If you point at, you can't point at two tips unless their blue score is uh, close enough. It's less, the, the difference is less than P. Okay. And um, so do you think this solves the problem? Or do, do uh, okay, maybe asking the crowd questions is not a, a good thing in this constellation. But the thing is yeah. that you would think, you might think that this solves the problem because you'd say, okay, now you can do this. But then you get this incre incredibly annoying climbing attack. Instead of just creating this block and this block, I'm, I'm going to climb my way up. I will first post this block C. And then I'll block, post another block, um, which points at C, and it points at the chain as high as I'm allowed while being valid. And then I keep going. So at each point, I'm only pointing at blocks which are sufficiently close to each other. So um, there isn't a problem. Uh, so. Um, Nothing here is invalid. This, all of these blocks are fine. And yet, again, the C points very, very to very, very old block. So it's arbitrarily old. It means this attack means that still, even if I impose this rule, I'm saying throw away all blocks that are at depth at least P and don't allow a difference of more than L, then still, I can do this attack and force you to to have to to have to retain the data of uh, arbitrarily old blocks and note that the amount of blocks I'm creating for every block I uh, for every L blocks the network the honest network creates I only have to create a single block so if I have one over L of the uh, of the network uh, global hash rate then I can create this attack and I can uh, essentially create, since I can do this, then you can't securely throw away blocks. Now, the thing is that L can't be too small because L has to be larger than K. Because if you set L equals one or L equals two, then you essentially don't allow um, this wide graph, wide DAG, which is exactly what gives Ghost DAG its edge and its speed. So L would be more like a hundred, and then, and then all of a sudden you get that an attacker with one percent, one and a half percent of the network can do this kind of thing, and you can say, okay, I can't securely throw away blocks. I'm gonna need to find a better solution. And these climbing attacks, I had nightmares about these attacks. Okay, it took us, I think, more than six months to come up with the protocol and. Every attempt we made along the way um, turned out to have some sort of climbing attack, one more com uh, sophisticated than the other. And at some point, I, I, I started to believe that it's mathematically impossible to solve the pruning problem. 
um, which is why uh, we resolved not to release the mainnet before we find a pooling protocol whose security you are able to mathematically uh, formally prove. And we did that. So I'm going to tell you uh, how we did this. And the idea is to go through um, finality again. So a finality depth is, again, the assumption that there is some depth F so that there would be no real um, deeper than F. So if, if you are F blocks down the selected chain, uh, the block that is F blocks down the selected chain will remain in the selected chain forever. This is the assumption we make, like in Bitcoin, like the 24 hours. And just for any block B, we say let BF be the block of depth F in the selected chain of B. So what this means essentially, you start with B, you go to the selected parent and you keep going until you arrive at a block whose blue score is smaller than the blue score of B by at least F. That's what this means. You don't have to understand this very precisely, just, just the point is that it took about F time, where F is going to be 24 hours eventually, to get from BF to B. This is the point. The block is, think about it in terms of time. No, the, the block is 24 hours deep. Um, so the intuition is that we say, okay, if we look at this BF, we don't think that there should be any blocks parallel to it. But that's not quite correct, right? Say we have this block B, and we go down here, and say this, we have this split, and one of these blocks is going to be in the selected chain, and the other one is not. And now these things happen all the time, right? You see this kind of formation in, K, in, uh, in KGI all of the time, right? Uh, so this is completely honest. There is nothing invalid here. This block is just fine. There is nothing wrong about it. So just not allowing blocks to be parallel to BF is, is too stringent. We have to find a way to, to soften this enough so that it would only exclude uh, attack attempts, only exclude adversarial blocks. So the solution is kind of complicated. It's what we call objective finality. Um, so here I've illustrated the situation we have. We have this block B. We have the selected chain of B, which is uh, at depth F, we have this B point F. And somewhere in the past of B, we also have this C, which is parallel to B dot F. So we want to find the condition. We want to say when this block C is bad, when we can consider it invalid. And this solution, for example, can't say here that this block is bad because this happens all of the time, honestly and organically. So this is essentially, if we go with this rule, we are again only allowing a chain. So I'm going to say the rule. It's complicated. Uh, I don't think uh, it's reasonable to completely understand why that's the rule, but um, I I'll try to give some intuition anyway. So the intuition is that we allow this kind of thing only if there is some block in the way between B and C which already confirmed C, which already um, is like a, it's testified that C is fine from his point of view already. And um, what I mean by this, so it's called the conflict confirmed block D and it has to satisfy three conditions. First, it has to be in the blue past of B. B has to think that D is a blue block. Second is that D has to know C, which is obvious. Uh, this is the only obvious one. And now the tricky one is the selected chain of D has to go through BF. Like B and D must both agree that this block BF um, has this... Um, uh, this block BF is in both of their selected chains. If such a block D exists, then we say, okay, fine. Even though this C is parallel to the finality block, uh, we see that somewhere along the way it was already confirmed and then uh, it's not a problem. If there is no such block, we're saying yeah, B is invalid because it tries to be the first confirming block of a block which is way too deep. So if we go back 
to this thing we see that even though we have this block which is parallel to the uh, to the uh, finality block this block would confirm it. it it satisfies all the conditions right very trivially it is it also has bf in its selected chain because this is the selected chain and uh, it is blue uh, b thinks this is blue because all of this is blue because in a chain all blocks are blue and obviously uh, this block is in the place of this block so here we see all the conditions hold trivially um, but proving that this condition is enough is, I think it's, it's probably um, the most complicated proof uh, we've done up to Dagnite. Um, I, I don't know very thoroughly the proofs of Dagnite, but they seem to be more complicated than this. But this is a complicated proof. It's not a deep proof, it's just a lot of bookkeeping. Uh, here on the right there is like this illustration of the proofs. Unfortunately, all the notations are uh, completely different here, but it's just like to illustrate that uh, this is like a, a bookkeeping proof. You just trace everything and see that everything works out. Um, and the protocol itself is just to sum it up. A block is invalid if one of the following holds. Either it has an invalid block in its best, or it merges more than L blocks. That is, there are more than L blocks that are in its best, but they are not in the best of its selected parents or it violates the objective finality, the condition I said uh, earlier. And now we have this theorem um, by Sutton and myself, again stated here informally, that if we assume that there are no splits, no reorgs of depth F, we can set P to be this thing, it's about 2F, 2F and a little bit more, uh, we, because this L here would be much smaller than F, and K would be much smaller than F, because L is like uh, in the hundreds and K is like in the dozens and F is like in the tens of thousands because we have 86,400 seconds in a day. And um, so if we assume there are no reox of depth F, we can throw away all of the blocks except the blocks that are in the future of the chain block of depth P. That is, we start with the current block, we go, go, go to the depth P, we see the block that is there, and we erase the data on all blocks, but this block and all the blocks in its future, which turn out to be a constant amount of blocks. <laughs> in practice, we set F to be 24 hours and L to be 180, and uh, it's not stated here, but here we have two F, so if F is 24 hours, then P is, is going to be about a, a little more than, than two days. Um, in practice, we can tighten it even more. The, instead of this two F, we're going to get F plus something else, and it's, gonna, it's more like uh, if we set F to be 24 hours, then P will, is going to be about uh, somewhere between 25 and 26 hours. We don't need the full 48 hours, so I'm not going to go into this right now. Um, so what's the intuition of this proof? Why, why are these rules correct? So remember this situation, right? And um, so this is not considered uh, in valid, right? In this situation, X violates the objective finality because it points to this block's ear, which is on the, um, on, oh, it should be BF. It's on the um, it's on the anticon of BF. It's a, it's parallel to BF, and there is no conflicting block or any block along the way. So an attack to make this thing valid, an attacker would have to create this climbing attack where he creates more and more and more blocks. Um, but because we have this um, depth F, what happens is that a lot of these blocks are not going to be in the, um, in the past of B. So we are going to get that X merges too many blocks, more than L blocks, and then it would violate the, by the bounded merge. So if I say it in a sentence, if you don't have enough conferring blocks, you violate the objective finality, but if you do have enough conferring blocks, 
then you would have to merge too many blocks. So you lose either way. One of these rules would make you invalid. Um, so that's all I had to say about this spawning. I think this is the most complicated thing um, up to there. I think this prunable version, which is the uh, version we implemented, uh, I think it's fair to say it might be the most subtle proof of work uh, protocol that's um, ever been implemented as far as I know. And I think this is also a good point to answer questions. We are almost at the end, by the way, so uh, don't get discouraged. Do we have any questions? Kind of got quiet on the chat side. I think I might have exhausted the audience for now. <laughs> so it's almost 1 a.m. Okay. Oh, we got two. All right, that guy's sleepy. Okay. Um, yeah, that looks good. I'm saying they love it. They love the description. Good job. Okay, nice. So cool. it's a thing when you give a lecture and the audience is quiet, either all of them understand you or nobody understands you. There is no middle ground. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not hoping. Medium. <laughs> yes, I'm hoping we are in the first scenario. Um, okay. So we talked about pruning data, but what about the headers? Now, a block which has uh, the the headers are much smaller. Um, but still by a constant factor. You can't keep all of the headers because again, um, so I don't remember the size of a header. I, I think it's like in the hundreds of bytes or something like that. Uh, but still, you would accumulate it like, uh, even if you accumulate a tera here, it's too much. You can't accumulate that much. So to talk about how we, uh, we can get rid of most of the headers, we need to talk about what is the purpose of headers? And so the reason we need the headers is because they serve as a genesis proof. What do I mean by that? So consider we only keep the headers from the last day. Um, and say we have an adversary which wants to take over the entire chain. Then the adversary, all they need to do is to produce a DAG, which is a day long, which seems to have more work put into it. Now, the deadly thing is that the attacker doesn't have to produce the DAG during a day, right? They can forge timestamps and manipulate the difficulty so that while this DAG looks like it took a day to create, the adversary actually worked on it for a year or for 10 years or for a month or whatever. And the point is that if we have an adversary with 1% of the uh, hash rate, it would take them a, like 101 days to produce a DAG, which is a day long and seems like it has more work put into it. And so any attacker, if they wait long enough, they could rewrite the entire history in a constant time. They could come up with something which looks like more work is put into it. And and the way we get over it right now is that, uh, like in Bitcoin, we all, like the naive way to get over it is to keep all of the headers. And then in order to, to create a new history, you have to put in the same amount of work that was put in all of the headers, not just the last 24 hours. And then you can't rewrite history anymore unless you actually produce more works than the honest network. So this is what I mean by proof of genesis. I mean that the headers serves to show that, um, that the state I'm giving to you right now um, has the same genesis as the honest network, as the genesis block that the network actually started from. And that I didn't reinvent just the last day of history and convinced you that it's the right one. Um, so the way to overcome this is uh, quite ingenious. Uh, it's not uh, a Caspa original. Uh, it's uh, a work by uh, Caius, Leonardos, and uh, Zindros. Um, and the idea is that we only keep headers of what we call super blocks. Now, uh, I remind you that in proof of work, essentially what you need to do is to find a nonce that makes your uh, the hash of your block small enough. So like if the target is 
30, then you need to find the nonce to put in your hash, in your uh, header, such that if you take the hash of this header, then it would start with 30 zeros. Sometimes you would actually find, accidentally uh, stumble onto a block, which even though you only had to produce 30 zeros, you produced 35 zeros. So this is what we call a five super block. Um, so if I look at all the blocks which has 30 zeros and I ask, okay, how many of them have 35 zeros, then uh, on average, it would be about one in every two to, two to the power of five because each bit has equal probability to be one or zero. So the probability that all five of them are zero is two to the five, or more generally with L. About two to the L would be L super blocks. And the thing is, we don't need to keep all of the blocks. What we do is that instead of keeping one reference, now I should have said this before, here I'm talking about blockchains again. And this paper, this work is about blockchains. And um, the thing is that um, each block doesn't keep a reference only to its parent on the original chain. It all, also keeps a reference to the um, to the latest one super block, to the latest two super block, to the latest three super block, etc., etc. Um, and now we don't need to have all of the blocks. We just need to have this um, the super enough super blocks for each L. And now I'm not going to describe exactly how they are selected, but if we are selecting them cleverly enough, then we get at this um, amazing consequence that on one hand, we only store a logarithmic amount of headers. What logarithmic means? It means that we keep one block for every time the number of blocks doubles. So like we keep the first block and the second block and the fourth block and the eighth blocks and the 16th block, et cetera, et cetera. So if we have like a million blocks, then we would only have, if we had a million blocks in our history, for this proof, we only have to keep like uh, 20 blocks. And this is, uh, logarithmic is very, very small. This is the point. We, it just adds one header for every time the number of block, dub, blocks doubles itself. Um, however, if we want to make a competing chain, we would still have to generate the same amount of work because these super blocks are much, much harder to produce than standard blocks. And this is the idea. Now, uh, Ori Newman and Yomaton Polinsky found, found a way to, um, to extend this idea to dug mining. Uh, in for prunable ghost dog, uh, it's rather straightforward. Instead of keeping super chains, we keep super dags. Um, it also requires to store a linear amount of pruning blocks, but uh, with a very small constant, essentially just one header for every uh, 24 hours. Um, so the entire proof adds up to less than one megabyte per year. So yes, this is this. Uh, accumulates, it's not a constant, but it's very, very small. One megabyte per year, even though technically it's linear, it's completely uh, forgivable and we can operate this way. And it only gets smaller with time, by the way. Um, the only problem with the solution is it's a bit RAM intense. Now, it requires memory, a lot of memory, not in a prohibitive way, but it is a performance bottleneck. So, uh, if you want some interesting theoretical problem to work on that will actually help make CASPA better, is to help us come up with a more RAM efficient solution for this DAG mining in a logarithmic space. Um, I'm pretty sure there are more um, uh, sophisticated things you could do. Um, and again, I stress this is by no means prohibitive. We, all of the benchmarks we see are uh, applying this, uh, this kind of a genesis proof. Uh, it just would be very nice to be able to, to make it more efficient because um, it would help us uh, run, on, um, run on even lighter hardware. And so that's about it for, um, for data pruning.
A any questions? Uh, looks like Jay got this. JWJ. Maybe it's good to elaborate. Lazarus okay. asked, so a super block is a block with a difficulty higher than the target dif difficulty? Yes, you can say this way. You can say that uh, you can say that the the target is how many zeros you need to to have in your preceding zeros in your hash, and a super block turns out to have more zeros than required. So, uh, if you produce um, fifty blocks, which uh, all satisfy the the condition that they have um, thirty zeros, then about half of them would have thirty one zeros just by pure luck. But if you now want to produce another block with 31 zeros, you'd have to work twice as hard. Uh, th this is the idea. Also, I got uh, what's stored on the node and how large the node is with pruning. So this is what I described. Um, what's stored on the node essentially is like about 26 hours of block data and headers and another logarithmic amount of headers and the headers of all the pruning blocks so far, uh, which adds up to a constant amount of, I don't remember how much, uh, I think a few dozen gigabits. And this is the constant parts and the non-constant parts accumulates at the size of about one megabyte per year. And beside that, there is also the UTXO set, which you have to store, um, which is uh, also, it, it, this is also a thing that grows, um, and uh, so far there, is not, uh, there isn't a very good solution to any tech for how to nicely store the UTXO set, though we do have some ideas, um, so this is still uh, an open problem. Nice. And, and... Storage is one of the things that's kind of getting cheaper as time goes on, it seems like. So would would you say this may not even be a problem in the future? Um, it would always be a problem. Um, uh, if we're talking about the block data, this would always be a problem because the storage does increase. You have to keep all of the data back. So, okay, maybe I should have said that it's not just about storage. Maybe even storage is not the most pressing concern here. Yeah, I definitely should have uh, started with that. The thing is not just about how much storage you want, need, but also about how long it takes to synchronize a node. Uh, because yeah. right now, if you don't have pruning and you want to synchronize a node, you have to obtain and, ver and uh, um, verify the entire history of the network to know that uh, your node is synced and uh, that it's uh, genuine and that uh, you're actually saying the correct history. And this is a very elaborate process. And um, the, the longer it is, the longer interruptions you have, the more you rely on having good connectivity and it just becomes much, much harder to synchronize a node. So um, I did a small survey about text and I, you see that in a lot of texts, it takes uh, days out, like optimistically three to four hours and pessimistically up to five days in some of the texts um, to sy fully synchronize a node. And that's very bad for the, the decentralization. You want nodes to be able to synchronize fast. And you see that in Caspa, uh, anyone can uh, synchronize a node in uh, under an hour, I think right now, it can take about 30, 40 minutes. And uh, I synchronized a, a Rust node. Now Rust synchronizes faster. It takes the same time to download all the stuff, obviously, but the verification of the chain is much, much faster. And I think it took less than 20 minutes to synchronize a node now. Compare it with like synchronizing, I don't know, a Kadena node, which takes literally a few days. So this is also a major, major consideration in why pruning is very important and it's just gonna get worse. Think about it. The time it takes to synchronize a node grows linearly with time. Like if now it takes five days, then in 10 years it's gonna take, so it's not gonna take 10 days because computers are gonna improve and the network is gonna improve, but 
it's going to take seven days. Again, as time will go on, it's going to take longer and longer to synchronize. It's not realistic. You can't do this in the long term. You must keep the, um, the sync times bounded regardless of how long your network has been operating. Gotcha. Do you want to touch smart contracts with this? There's some questions that are regarding pruning and smart contracts. Um, uh, actually, I don't right now um, okay. because, the, yeah, I mean, it's good questions um, about um, smart contracts are affected by pruning and they're affected by uh, conflict resolutions. And both of these things are relevant and there is a lot to say. The thing is that we are not in the context of smart contracts uh, right now. And um, I would much rather at some point give, maybe give a, a workshop or like a less, a less formal talk about how I envision smart contracts on CASPA. And then I will also talk about this. But the gist is that my opinion is that you don't want to implement um, like very expressive functionality natively on the chain. On chain, you want to uh, implement all sorts of uh, um, high profile functionalities that captures like 80% of applications, say the abstract account model uh, from Ethereum. And the rest you want to do by um, doing something off chain like uh, Arbitrum style and only settle in one chain and you can do this uh, rapidly, you can do like settle once every 10 seconds, which you can't do on chains, which requires five minutes to confirm. And this kind of removes most of the problems, by, but it still gives you the, a lot of security and a lot of uh, uh, responsiveness. And uh, it also removes the problems, I believe they alluded here, uh, that uh, if you have this smart contract, which runs for a long span of time and um, then uh, how are you gonna if you like say a condition which is only fulfilled like in five years or something then how are you gonna see it if you erase all data which is a, a day long and i think this kind of stuff uh, should just uh, happen, happen off chain okay let's take one more short one and move on uh is there any what's or any need whatsoever to host an archival node? Um, need like it depends on what you want to do. Um, for the security of the network, you don't need archival nodes. The, the network or can can operate completely fine without a single archival node. Um, I've seen some people saying that because archival nodes uh, are. Uh, hard to uh, require a lot of storage and are inaccessible and you rely on them then essentially you rely on a few powerful nodes and then you're not centralized which would have been an argument except you don't actually rely on these nodes in any way the reason you would want an archival node is because this data of uh, transactions and what happened might uh, be interesting for other reasons uh, it might be required for uh, i don't know uh, uh, I don't even want to say because I, I'm not sure why you would want it. Even for curiosity, even for research purposes, there is, there is, there are reasons why this data might be valuable. But if we're strictly speaking about running the network securely, then the, it doesn't rely on the existence of archival nodes in any way. Sounds good. I think we're good to move on. Okay. So uh, now the moment uh, I guess a lot of you have been waiting for, Dagnite. This is going to be very brief, especially because I don't know very much about Dagnite at this point. I'm going to share with you pretty much everything I do know about Dagnite. Um, so the property we like is parameterlessness. So Ghostdog has this limitation that um, the network delay bound uh, D that we talked about, it must be estimated in advance. And more than that, it must be taken with a margin of error. Um, so these are the consequences. One is that we must take a margin of error because it could be that the network conditions might deteriorate. So we can never run at full capacity. We can never be as efficient as possible. 
um, because we have to uh, account for cases where the, the, there will be a deterioration and D must be um, long enough to, so that the round trip time of the network is less than D at all times, at least for like 95% uh, of, the, of the nodes or something. Um, and so, so because, uh, so, uh, okay, that's what I said. It must take a marginal error because uh, if uh, network conditions are more than expected, then security is reduced. Um, and another consequence is if, if the network improves, then we don't improve with it. We keep running at uh, traits that were supported by the networks of the day we launched, right? Unless we do a hard fork or something. So the question is if a protocol can react to network conditions, can we have a protocol that's always as efficient as possible, eliminating the margin of error because it would react both to uh, deteriorate in network conditions, letting the protocol become slower if the network can't handle the speed right now, but also scale itself and become faster and faster as networks improve. So we call such a protocol parameterless, exactly because we don't have this parameter D. And the first parameterless protocol, as I said, was the Spectre protocol um, devised by some Kolinsky and Zohar. And as I said before, it's parameterless. It's a, a beautiful protocol, um, a, but it does not give us a, a, a full ordering. And um, this does not allow any uh, higher functionality and therefore it's prohibitive because we do want to uh, provide smart contracts or uh, at least uh, uh, abstract accounts model at some point, and you can't do this on Spectre. Uh, Dag Knight, this um, gem by uh, uh, some Polensky and Saturn, or should I say Jonathan and Michael, um, able to achieve this. It's the only protocol that it's, is parameterless and provides a total ordering and gives you um, scales down the confirmation times um, to network latency, and it's it's essentially the perfect proof of work protocol. So I've said it many times, but you can't expect more of a proof of work protocol. So any anything you would expect more than what Dagnites already achieves is, I believe, impossible. And the idea is simple. The core idea is simple. Instead of fixing K we need to find the minimal K such that the maximal K cluster covers half of the blocks. So if you, you remember how KGI looks like, um, you'll see that even though K equals 18, the width of the network is usually around one or two or three, sometimes it goes to five, but it, you don't normally see it go to 18. And the reason for that is exactly this security margin I talked about. Now, imagine that, the, and remember that choosing a K, a large K, has a detrimental effect on confirmation times, and uh, because uh, the security you eventually achieve is a function of K, and like the number of blocks you want to wait is a function of K. So. Imagine like a reality where this K adjusts itself when the network is very connected and, and it looks like a chain and K would be zero. Then uh, we see a few blocks which are kind of parallel then K would become one or two and go to four and back and then it would become zero again and it would never have to um, be fixed. And the confirmation times will... Uh, will uh, change accordingly because again, there are function K. If K becomes smaller, then the confirmations become faster. And this is exactly what the Ignite did. It just say, find the minimal K, which is sufficient, which such that the blue blocks would be more than half of the blocks. And now the problem with this idea, like in Phantom, that this is intractable. Again, finding a maximal K cluster is a, a very hard problem. And now in Phantom, we went from Phantom to Ghostdog because we had this very, very straightforward way to make a greedy approximate variant. And in Phantom, in a Dagnite, it's not that simple. 
it's very hard to find a way um, to um, define a greedy variant of this thing and most of the straightforward ways would result in, an, uh, in a protocol which is, uh, which is not secure, which is broken. Um, but after a lot of work, uh, Michael and Jonathan found a way to define a greedy version that actually works and this is what we call the Ignite. So this is essentially everything I know about this. Uh, if you want to know more, either read the paper or talk to Michael. But this is the, the big picture of what's going on there. Questions? Uh, not on Dagnite, it looks like. Beautiful. So um, now I'm going to mention a few further topics, and then uh, we're going to um, uh, conclude this talk. Um, so just. A few things we didn't cover today, but I, I think are very interesting and I would love to, to cover them in, in future workshops. So one is difficulty adjustment. Um, how do you even decide what is the difficulty target of a block? So in difficulty adjustment, the idea is simple. Take the last, I don't know, a thousand blocks, look at how long it took to create them or somehow approximate it using timestamps. And then if it took like, I don't know, um, it took like 80% uh, of the time you thought it should take, then you increase the difficulty by 25%. So in a DAG, the problem is what are the latest thousand blocks? How do you decide which are the latest blocks? You don't have this chain anymore. The causality structure is much more complicated. And it turns out that picking this window, picking what are the latest blocks um, in a bad way leads to very, very, um, very vicious difficulty manipulation attacks. So there is this entire discussions of how to properly choose the difficulty window and it uh, took me quite a long time to find uh, something which I could uh, reason about its security. So I think this is a very interesting aspect of uh, CASPA. Um, I actually don't know how difficulty adjustment is done in uh, other DAGs. Um, another thing is that we made this assumption that given two blocks, it's very easy to um, determine whether they know each other or not. Um, in practice, it's actually very hard. Um, it's not known if it's even possible to do it efficiently for general DAGs, but uh, uh, Michael Sutton come up, came up with a way to do it efficiently under the assumptions that the DAGs are narrow, which is exactly the assumptions that every block doesn't have a lot of um, parallel blocks and uh, the, the uh, algorithm he came up for this is very interesting and uh, it's also a crucial aspect for Casper. Without it, Casper couldn't have uh, existed. Um, another uh, very interesting topic in which I have a lot to say is about transaction selection games. Um, you know that you have to choose transactions from the mempool and put them in the block. So in Bitcoin, it's done very simply. You just take the highest fee paying transactions and put them in a block. Uh, in DAX, it's not quite the case because if you have parallel blocks and you put the same transactions in the blocks, then one of the miners is going to take all of the fees and the other miner is going to get nothing. It depends on the precedence. So miners, the rational thing for miners to do is to um, randomly select the transactions um, by uh, and giving some more precedence to higher fees. And the first thing we noted that this doesn't have a detrimental effect. So like, even though you would see some parallel transactions, it wouldn't harm the throughput so much. Now, I have a few, um, new, few thoughts that uh, came to me in the last few months that I think that not only this, transactions, this random transaction rule doesn't harm the transaction throughput. I think it actually has some very nice positive um, effects on the dynamics of the fee market. And I have some conjectures uh, about this, which I would like to share with the audience. And I think if someone is looking for a very cool uh, uh, research product on the, on the border of uh, math and economies, I think there are some very interesting questions there, which also 
um, directly affect CASPA because if we manage to prove some of these conjectures, it would prove that CASPA actually provides a nicer fee market than the blockchains could provide. Um, another thing I like to talk about is the, the positive effects of high BPS on mining des decentralization and why I think high BPS is essentially completely um, uh, crucial for a uh, long-term proof of work chains, especially deflationary chains. Smart contracts also, I think the, the, the fast confirmations and high throughput of CASPA allows us, uh, it kind of paves the way for um, architectures of smart contracts that were so far avoided because they were considered inefficient, inefficient even though they are much simpler than having a lot of functionality natively supported on the chain. Um, and now with the very fast confirmation times, we can um, revive these approaches and achieve stuff that is both simple and very, very fast and get out of this uh, mess of problems of like uh, very complicated state transitions and uh, gas fees and all of this uh, hot mess without uh, compromising speed or security. Uh, there are very interesting avenues um, of research and engineering there. And another thing is that um, the higher synchronicity and the fact that a lot of blocks are created in parallel might be a very interesting countermeasure to um, minor extractable values, which is something that uh, for now uh, we don't, uh, like we see Ethereum and in general MEV causes a lot of problems and there aren't very good solutions. Um, and where there are solutions that are very heavy, it's stuff like uh, uh, encrypting all the transactions and stuff which um, makes everything um, very uh, heavy and inefficient. And um, we, uh, Jonathan has some ideas of how this higher asynchronicity of the DAG could provide some novel approaches to countermeasure MEV without uh, these sacrifices. Um, uh, another interesting aspect we would like to talk about sometimes is the fact that this uh, DAG structure with a lot of parallel blocks allows us to do a lot more parallel processing than other chains, which again allows us to increase throughputs without increasing hardware and requirement, just better utilizing the same hardware. And so that's about it. If there are any questions about this slide. Not this slide, but I do have a late DAG night question. They said, mm -hmm. uh, would this mean that smaller K causes faster confirmation times? Yeah, definitely. Um, if we go back a little bit, a lot bit, um, um, where is this slide? No, uh, I went too far. Just a second here. Yeah, so if you see here, uh, oh, it was here. No, it wasn't here, it was here. You see that K directly affects how, how much confirmations you want to wait for. So the fact that you can decrease K when possible means that you decrease confirmation times when it's possible. That's the, the, the most, uh, um, the, the, the most uh, important consequence of the Ignite is exactly that, that you can decrease and increase K and consequentially you get, um, you get the confirmation times becomes uh, shorter or longer depending on network conditions and are not fixed to some bound on the network latency. That's exactly the benefit of the Ignite. Perfect. And then what do you think the bottleneck of CASPA is? They give examples as disk, I.O., bandwidth, CPU. So um, this is more of a question for like uh, devs. I am more of a researcher and I haven't done any profiling of the system. Uh, I don't know uh, what which resources are uh, uh, more heavy than the others. I did point out one example though. Um, which is this uh, that uh, um, the 
the pruning proof, like the proof of Genesis, uh, he is a bit RAM intensive and this is a bottleneck of, uh, on our performance. So this is an example of problem to which a more efficient solution would have like a straightforward immediate effect of uh, what hardware is required to run a Casper node. Do we so, have any last minute questions regarding today's topics? This is your final slide, right? I'm not cutting you off. This is my final slide. Ah, nice. Yes. Uh, Boudini says awesome presentation. Thanks. Yeah, I think I'm gonna join you in the in the chat for a while. I'm I'm gonna answer like I'm gonna speak because I I want you to keep recording, but I'm gonna join. I'm gonna just look at the chat myself. Yeah, absolutely. But I, I only see the Discord and not the Twitch, so uh, you can uh, follow me things from there. Okay, I was asked for a price predictions. I don't talk price. I never talk <laughs> price. <laughs> um, okay, I get uh, a lot of compliments, which I appreciate dearly, but uh, I don't see a lot of questions. So uh, I think maybe now it's a good time to um, stop because my throat is killing me at this point. <laughs> yeah, it was so, awesome, man. This is this is I really appreciate this. This is an amazing presentation. There's a lot of content here that I learned from, and I didn't know much about pruning, so this was this was fascinating for me at least. Yeah, pruning was like my main goal here because the pruning is absolutely essential. You can't have high throughput without pruning. It's impossible. And we worked so hard, so hard on making this work. And like the world doesn't know because there isn't any accessible source to it. There is only like this dense uh, correspondence, public but dense and not friendly at all correspondence between me and Jonathan and Michael Sutton and Mike Zach and like this PDF, which is just like, a proof written so it would be documented and I really wanted to have some place I could refer people who asked about the pruning and they can watch it and have at least a high view understanding of how this thing works because man it was hard it was a and, and, and it's game changing I mean we couldn't have lunch without it and people need to understand this we need to decentralize this knowledge <laughs>